we're at very very often at the lowest end of the survivalist end of the um, kind of economy we see um, we see a lot of women sitting in that particular spot and I think was something that really resonated with what Ed was talking about around how difficult it is for many women to enter into the entre into enter into entrepreneurship that there are a lot of barriers there's social barriers the reproductive roles of women are still very very vital to what, how households function, to how cities function. And so to find jobs and to find employment and to create entre entrepreneurship, which allows women to go beyond survivalist activities is very difficult. We also see that there's a very gendered um, um, issue around how um, informal entrepreneurs are located. Many women are still based in home-based enterprises. Men are very often taking advantages of these hives and nodes and all kind of industrial parks, but women don't seem to be taking advantage of them. They're located at home, they're located close to home. And once again, this is very much about um, the reproductive role, which is holding women back in a lot of ways um, in, in the kind of entrepreneurships. We also see sectoral niches between men and women. Very often within the informal sector, women are, as um, actually Ed showed, and I thought this is an interesting resonance between the two the countries that he was showing. South African women are very much involved in food production, in beading, in all kinds of traditional craftwear to a large degree, in apparels, those kinds of things. Men tend to be involved in much more physical activities. And once again, there's also a gendered division around who does what and where. Not to mention the other very important kind of um, distinction that we see within the informal sector, where high degrees, higher levels of involvement of foreign nationals. Lots and lots of people from many African countries, from Southeast Asia, coming to South Africa and operating in a number of different sectors in the informal, in the informal economy. Um, so what we tend to think about when we think about the informal economy, think about how it's kind of characterized or how it's typified or how we would understand it, is, this is these are jobs with high levels of precarity, little to no social protection. If somebody is ill, if somebody has to take leave, that's it. You lose your money, you lose your economy, you lose your space, you lose everything that goes along with it. And we also see that it's highly unpredictable in terms of earnings. We also know that the informal economy is incredibly interwoven into the formal. It's not as if we have these two, and this is an obvious point to most people. It's not as if we have an informal economy and a formal economy. Rather, these things are totally interwoven between each other. They're mutually constructive, they're mutually supportive, and they're mutually productive. But we also know that um, we've seen 2.2 million jobs that have been lost in South Africa due to COVID-19. And we no doubt know that this has affected a lot of people in both the formal and the informal sector at the moment. So that's just to give a slice of some a small picture of what's been going on within the informal sector, particularly in Gauteng and Johannesburg at the moment. Okay, so to talk about well, what are the challenges, what are the issues that have been facing entrepreneurship over the last time, and I'm going to talk about three particular points, three, that's three, yes, let me hold up the correct number of fingers. Um, the one, and possibly starting at the at a highest level, is there's been a highly inconsistent policy regime for a very, very long time. The state has gone between um, a very laissez-faire kind of approach to evictions and eradications. It's gone through moments of violent oppression. It's gone into ideas of support and kind of some kind of construction. And so over time, what we've seen is this real kind of lack of decision around how to think about the informal sector, how to support it and what to do about it. And it's created a great deal of tension and mistrust between the state and with, and with entrepreneurs themselves. They don't know what's gonna happen from year to year. There's massive precarity. In 2013, we had our Operation Clean Sweep and by 2016, um, the then mayor committed to growing the formal and informal economy every year by X number of percent. Um, we see that this is we see a situation where the um, national departments um, are very clear about the fact that they want to support, they want to grow the second economy, it's part of the African Renaissance, but there's distinctions between what happens at the national level and what's happening at the municipal and metropolitan level with the huge um, issues of, of oppression and uh, situations where informal traders are evicted, where their suck is taken and so on and so forth. And now, most recently, to make life even more interesting, We've had the Gauteng Township Development Bill, which came out for comment a few weeks ago. And here in chapter three, it talks about the, the reservation for citizens or persons of permanent residency of certain kinds of jobs, including wholesale, retail, agricultural, mining, manufacturing, transport, community, and social and personal services for South Africans. Now, this is hugely concerning. 
um, to say that we'll reserve jobs for South Africa and exclude foreign nationals. And once again, this raises question marks around, is this even constitutional? How do how we even begin to kind of comprehend this kind of idea in South Africa in 2020? But what it speaks to is really these tensions, these contestations between the different spheres of government around what's supposed to be going on, around what the policy should be saying, about who is supported, and also this tension that sweeps across time within um, the, the informal sector in terms of the policy. Who is, who, who is saying what? What is supposed to be going on? So that's a big issue over there. The second issue that comes up with in, in almost all of the research that we've done on um, informal trade, on the inner city, is the role that happens with um, police harassment and official harassment and official issues. We see that the JMPD, who have been um, told that they are the arbiters and they are the um, forces of bylaws coming in, and very often they are confiscating goods, they are um, harassing um, the informal traders on the street, they are telling them they can't work from there, they're relocating them, there have been a series of issues, and this goes on day after day after day within particularly the inner city of Johannesburg, but so to the inner city of Pretoria, the Chwani. We know that these things are happening in Ikuruleni. It's really a, a characteristic that's sweeping across the country itself. And, you know, to try and try and understand what's going on, in very many ways, the, this is because the JMPD and so on are seeing themselves, the, that's the Johannesburg Metropolitan Police Department, see themselves as the enforcers of the bylaws. But very often it's because there's an enormous amount of corruption, bribes are demanded for protection, for permits. There's some sort of phobia coming on. And also what we do, we see is that there's a level of arbitrariness around how the rules are applied to those who are working on the streets, to the informal traders themselves. And there's this great quote um, that happened during lockdown, said when the minister announced that uh, level four at level, level four informal traders would be included, but only to sell essential items like winter stuff, we had, uh, we had our hopes high. To our amazement, those who are selling socks and stockings, their stuff was confiscated by the Johannesburg Metropolitan Police Department. And so we start to see real issues around how the law is enforced, who it's enforced by, and there are consequences for the traders themselves. Um, and so the last point that kind of kind of cascades down from this is a question of bylaws. And bylaws are really the most local, the most immediate interface between citizens, residents, uh, those who operate in cities and the state. They are the, the, the most immediate interface that goes on. And so what's happened in terms of informal trade and bylaws is that there's been an idea that there'll be designated spaces, people have permits to trade. Um, that bylaws prevent trading activities in peak traffic or pedestrian movement, they have to be certain sizes, that certain zones in terms of how the city is, is zoned in terms of its land use are restricted for residential use only. And so these kinds of systems lend themselves to all corruption. These kinds of bylaws which are not useful, which... to are for people to trade. So where to from here? Well, to my mind, well, we need a very consistent, clear and consistent policy regime cascading all the way down from, from national to, to local government. We need to be careful about bias within our policy and we can be sure to remove it. We need to think carefully and really consistently about this idea of consistent enforcement and not just arbitrary enforcement and not corrupt enforcement. And we have to have better physical infrastructure. In some of the studies we did, we could see a clear relationship between the order of activity that was taking place and the amount of infrastructure that was available. So in places which only had water or which had no facilities, no water, no electricity, um, no Wi-Fi, all of these things, you are very restricted as to what kinds of activities you can, you can, you can um, actually take part of. But the more infrastructure you have, the more your opportunities you have and the more you can possibly potentially do. And then we need to speak to the current debates around the land reform policy. Much of the land reform policy that's been going on at the moment has been focused on residential space. But we need land for productive activities. We need to think about what's happening for the poor in our cities and how they can access land for those kinds of activities. So where do we end up? Argument, regulate within reason. I mean, as, as um, Ed said, the Pink Flamingo case is absolutely outstanding. It shows exactly what happens when regulations are difficult, where the barriers to entry are too high, where it's hard to think about. Stop making it so bad. And in the current context around COVID, we need to think about what are good and bad um, economic densities and employment, and how do we support the good kinds of densities, and how do we think carefully about supporting and, and um, uh, concerning ourselves with what the bad densities are and making sure that those and the pandemic doesn't actually uh, 
doesn't actually disable people during those times. 